Please stand for the words of our King. Our Gospel this morning is taken from the Gospel of John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down His life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and it does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. So far our text. Please be seated. Dear Christian friends, I love Christmas, I love Easter, and then, I don't know, Good Shepherd Sunday is probably tied for third with Saints Triumphant. There's a few different Sundays in the church year that just the messages are beautiful. How many different ways can you take Psalm 23 and make it into a poem, set it to a beautiful Gaelic melody so you walk out of church humming it? That is Good Shepherd Sunday. It's awesome. And so it's a lot of fun to every year at least spend one week just beating on how dumb sheep are and how wonderful our Good Shepherd is. The only problem is the the parallels between us and sheep are just striking. They are. And so you start off by saying sheep are adorable, lovely. How many of us haven't had sheep adorn the uh, baby's room that you've seen? I mean, right up there with Noah's Ark, the sheep are everywhere, and it's awesome. Well, it's still resurrection reality. We're still in the Easter season, and we're talking about the reality of having a good shepherd. How does that change your life? Well, he died for you that you might live for him. And he died for you that you might live forever with him. It's pretty awesome. Well, before we jump into sheep life, let's spend a little time talking about the Good Shepherd. He says, I am the Good Shepherd. Jesus says the Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And to help us understand how Jesus is good, he compares us to shepherds who are bad. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus states again after this bad example, I am the good shepherd. There was a gentleman who went to the Middle East and he was talking to some shepherds where um, animal husbandry is a big deal. This is an industry. It still is in different parts of the world, but he was talking to a Bedouin who did this for a living, and he told this, this man who was a shepherd the story of the good shepherd. And this guy wanted to push back. It was the story of the good shepherd leaving the 99 and going after the one lost sheep. And then you get it and you take it back. And he said, that's, that's not a good shepherd. He said, if that was my sheep, I would probably kill it if it came back. And he said, well, wow. That's awful. Why would you do that? And the Bedouin said, well, by saving the sheep, the shepherd accomplished nothing because this same sheep will probably run away again and again. He's wasting his time and effort on a beast too stupid to even appreciate it. Now, I I don't think that he's necessarily a bad shepherd, objectively speaking, as you try to run a business. But that's not what I would qualify as the good shepherd. And I'm extremely thankful that's not how our God treats us. Even though that's probably what I deserve. Our God longs, His heart breaks for sheep who are lost. He goes after them constantly. And He sends you out after those lost sheep as well. Anyone who doesn't know their good shepherd needs to. And there's urgency in this. 
Well, the good shepherd knows this. This is verse 14. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. That includes more than your uh, name, phone number, and physical address. He knows all of your ups and downs. He knows you better than you know yourself. How well, parents, do you want to know your children? Or maybe if you're a child caring for an older parent, how well do you want to know them? Or maybe a spouse or a girlfriend, how well do you long to know the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with? That's how God knows you as much as you could ever want. And that doesn't make him recoil in horror either. It does the exact opposite. Because what makes Jesus the good shepherd is that he lays down his life for the sheep. He said these words about six months before he was executed by Rome. The fact that he would die for you is how you know that Jesus is the good shepherd. He does provide and feed for us and care for us, but that's not how you know He's the Good Shepherd. And this gets us back to the sheep on their backs. That's a very real problem for sheep. And it's not an exaggeration to say that's a real problem for us. Have you fallen into debt? Illness? Grief? Guilt? Depression? These can be crippling. And when you look at the general society, you see all the symptoms everywhere. And I'm here to tell you if that has fallen upon you, member of Star Bethlehem Lutheran Church, you're not alone. There's nothing wrong with you per se. These are all symptoms of living in a fallen world, clothed in sinful flesh, being dogged by the devil who hates you. And so you need help. So do I sometimes. That's where the Good Shepherd picks me up and dusts me off when I fail. He forgives me and He empowers me to come back every Sunday and share with you an incredible message. You see, He died for you. That's your new resurrection reality. So that you might live for Him. There's a story um, that was told. This is a tragic one. Hundreds of sheep followed their leader off a cliff in eastern Turkey. What happened was um, these sheep got too close to a cliff. This was a large herd of a few thousand sheep. And 400 of them walked off the cliff and just kept on following. And they just kept on going. And the good news is that after about 400 of them fell off the, the cliff, those broke the fall of the next 1,100 that went off. So they didn't die. Now, some of those were injured and had to be put down. But... But the good news is that they didn't all die. Now, you might be saying, where are the shepherds? Well, they were eating a longer breakfast and they weren't paying attention and the sheep got too close to the cliff and then off they went. They said that the loss was in the tens of thousands of dollars. Now, I tell you this story because I want to ask you, could you ever imagine thousands of sheep following one foolish leader to their death? You know, there's badly wounded? Well, I, I told you it happened. But... Who would follow an individual, a lifestyle, a philosophy that would end in only personal or eternal destruction? Can you imagine anyone in our nation and culture doing that? Yeah. It's heartbreaking to watch, isn't it? And wouldn't you love it if someone would say, hey, Pastor Fred, you're going the wrong direction. If you keep going down that path, you're going to go over the cliff to your doom. It'd be nice if someone in love would say that to me, right? You've got to be nice to me. I'm kind of sensitive. But that would be helpful. That's what we do, fellow sheep. We point out to people, don't go down that path. It leads off of a cliff and millions have already fallen off of. Avoid it like the plague. Don't go there. Go a different way that leads to life. Using the image of Psalm 23, so you mean by like a tree planted by streams of water. It's beautiful. Well, the good shepherd laid down his life that we might live our lives for him. And I, I know that I started saying that sheep can be kind of dumb, and maybe that's a little harsh. True, in a thunderstorm, sheep have been known to go to the corner of the pen 
and keep on piling on top of each other so that the sheep at the bottom actually suffocate and die and are trampled and crushed. That's not great, okay? But if they have a leader, they do pretty well, assuming the leader doesn't leave off a cliff. And the next example is that of being a leader. And I, I don't know if you folks realize how powerful your leadership is. I don't know if I said, raise your hand if you think you're a leader. A lot of you probably wouldn't, but you have to understand, if you lead your family to hear God's word, you are that. And that leadership doesn't go unnoticed. And that goes for our young ones too, because I know that you're young. I don't care if you're in kindergarten or third grade or whatever. You could still be a leader, and those little sheep will follow you. Go on any playground, and you can see who the leaders are. That quality of leadership doesn't get less important as people get older. Lack of leadership ruins companies, drives schools into the ground, and can handicap churches for decades. Leadership is a big deal, and I want to, for you to know that when you lead people, it might just be your own family, into God's Word, the results are incredible. And I think that that godly habit is how it starts. Part of having a good habit is starting the bad ones. Did you know that if a sheep is standing at a fence, and if he sees a clump of grass that he wants, he will beat his head against the fence until he injures himself. Now, some sheep grow out of this, okay? So there's hope. And the point is, you can break bad habits. All right? And so leadership is good, but breaking those destructive habits is a really good one. And you can look around in America and you could say, do we have any destructive habits? Well, maybe it's the rising, well, universality of drug use. Maybe it's how we view our identity in Jesus. Maybe it's, it's those cravings that we have as adults. And in America, in our society, I'd say it's probably the craving for money. It's that lust for money and probably lust for sex. That is just destroying our country. And it replaces the good things that God has placed into our world with things that only empty, leave us empty and leave life meaningless. Our Good Shepherd wants something far more than that for us. You see, He died that we might live for Him, but He also died that we might live forever. Listen to what He says, verse 18. No one takes it from me. He's talking about His life, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. And uh, I'm reminded of this uh, as people message me online. I've been doing more and more videos. And people say, tell it to me over again, almost weekly, that Jesus is not God. And I want to share this verse with them. I think he just said he was. Because you would be a lunatic to think that you could take up your own life after you died. Unless you're God and you did it. Jesus is God in the flesh. And he lives and it's that truth that can transcend even the horrors of life. There's a story, this goes back, this is in 2006, there's a six-year-old girl. And um, my eldest would have been this age. She died in a freak car accident. It's, her name was Cassie Kennedy. Cassie was in the front seat of her family's minivan. It was in park and no keys were in it, yet somehow it rolled down the hill, striking a tree, setting off the airbag that killed her. You talk about a tragedy. And they interviewed the dad after this accident happened and he was heartbroken and he was in tears, but he said this, the crying I'm doing is mainly for me and for us because I know that she's talking to the King of Kings now. You see, what's transformative is that when tragedy strikes and you see this happen, or anything, the reality of the resurrection changes your outlook your perspective. Because you know that you're going to meet Cassie one day. Because that little six-year-old girl was introduced to her good shepherd. And as you raise your lambs, you take them to the good shepherd and they know who he is. And he loves them. Just like he loves you. He proved that love not because He provides for their every need during life, 
Not because he has a plan laid out for them that might involve college, maybe not, but a career that's successful, maybe grandkids. Those are all good, but you know, in spite of all the horrors that might happen in this life, that your good shepherd loves you because he laid down his life for you. That truth trumps everything else. And I have to say that, and I follow Jesus suffering and death with the sheep in the back because when I say to people, Jesus died for your sins, that's how you know that he loves you. They come back and they say, but Pastor Fred, X, Y, Z, and PDQ have happened to me. And they're horrible. How do I know? Every circumstance in my life tells me that the good shepherd has forgotten about me and I'm walking toward the cliff and you want to tell them no. He is carrying you right now. He picked you up. And you are safe in His almighty arms. And I know that you're suffering right now. But He's not left you alone. Sheep, this is your life. It's your eternal life. The Good Shepherd died so that you, His sheep, can live for Him and you can live for eternity. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds.